SRAM has sent me a set of their brand new G2 Ultimate brakes to make a video about and tell you all about the technical features. Only trouble is, it's, it, well, it's sunny, so I've put them on my bike instead and we're here in the woods. Ah, there we go, that's better. Out in the woods, just where I like being. Now this is great because you get to see the brakes being used by an everyday mountain biker on an everyday mountain bike in an everyday mountain biking location. Now, the G2 brake. This is the second generation version of the Guide, which is an immensely popular brake from SRAM that's suitable for virtually every discipline of mountain biking that we have a name for. I guess you could call it then the Guide 2, but I'm gonna call it the G2 because that's what it says on the levers. There's two main models currently in the range. There's the G2 Ultimate that I have right here in front of me. And there's also the RSC model, which of course have slightly different features on them. Now the brakes themselves are available with rotor sizes from 140 all the way up to 200 mil. Although there is a 220 millimeter rotor option coming further down the line. Now the standard rotors are 1.85 millimeters thick, whereas the bigger 220s, they're two millimeters thick. So they're slightly stiffer, and also aids a bit of heat dissipation. Now SRAM say that the G2 offers more power, more consistency, better quality, better feel, and more value for money. Fantastic. So let's have a little look at SRAM and their braking history. Now SRAM actually has only been producing brakes under the SRAM name since 2015. And that brake was the Guide. That's right, the first incarnation of that G2. Now the Guide is an absolutely fantastic brake and it took everything that SRAM had learned from the previous name, which was Avid, of course. Now they produced brakes under the Avid name from the very beginning. Now this leads me to something very cool about SRAM as a company. Now SRAM is almost a collective of companies that are all are specialists in their respective fields. For example, RockShox. RockShox were the first company to make mountain bike suspension forks. And then there's Avid. The thing with Avid, it was a company born of necessity. Avid's founder, Wayne Lumpkin, basically he was a mountain biker in need of a lower gear to help him winch up those climbs. And there wasn't a way of currently putting a smaller chainring on his bike. So he basically manufactured his own adapter in order for him to put far smaller chainrings on. So that was the very first product by Avid. Then following on from there, came their brakes. There was a tri-line cantilever brakes, which were CNC works of art. And there was also the speed dial lever that came with them. Now they were so good and they were so sought after that at the time when all the other companies were producing CNC machine stuff, Avid nearly destroyed them all. And then later on, Avid became a bit more mass market, going into bigger, bigger markets, going to the OEM. And this was a much later version of that speed dial lever. But you can see, even from the beginning, Avid had a lot of adjustability with the lever fill there, built into them just with a dial on the front there. You could dial in basically your braking power and of course the adjustability and the lever reach. So they had a lot of features crammed in. But if we skip forward to 2003, this is where things really heated up with the Juicy. Uh, this one's one of my old ones. This is a Juicy Ultimate and it's in a bit of a state as you can see. However, these were phenomenal and they only got better as things moved on. Now this is something SRAM are continuing and have done since 2015 with the Guide and now with the new G2. It's really a brake for every mountain bike. It suits all bikes. It's really, really powerful. It's also very light. I mean, I say it suits nearly all mountain bikers because there's still the code. The code, of course, is the big, heavy-duty, downhill, capable caliper. It's not that much more powerful, but it does cope with heat that bit better, but it is heavier, so there's a trade-off. This isn't a brake for every mountain bike. It's for the gravity focus. And, of course, there's the level as well. And the level will suit those looking for less power and more in the, basically in the lightweight stakes. The G2 is where it's at. Okay then, so let's take a closer look at the G2 and we'll see how it differs from other brakes currently offered by SRAM. Starting right here up at the handlebars, looking at the brake levers. 
Now the lever body itself is a brand new design, although it does use the same sealing system already seen on the current guide brakes. Now on both models offered, the RSC and the Ultimate, there are two main adjustments on the lever. You can adjust the reach just with this knob on the front here, and you can also adjust the bite point of the actual brake pads by this dial right here on the front. The swing link system is something we've seen on previous models of SRAM brake, and it's very much a tried and tested feature and it increases the modulation when you're using a brake and it also reduces the dead band, which is how much the pads move in relation to how much the levers move. Sometimes you have that sort of dead patch. So that is reduced by having that feature. Now the guide RSC, i.e. not the one I have here, has a larger pivot dowel and bushing setup. And the aim of that is to reduce the amount of flop that you get at the end of the lever, so it's more laterally stiff. Of course, wobbly levers are a little bit annoying, so that is dramatically reduced on the new model. Whereas this one here, the Ultimate that I have, actually has a bearing as part of the lever, and it's got a carbon lever as well, again, with no movement there at all. It feels very stiff and very smooth. The leverage ratios on the lever itself between uh, the code, the guide and the G2 swinging brakes is now actually all the same. So although power can differ between say the, the code and the G2 slightly, they will feel the same at the lever. So you've got the same consistency amongst all the brakes. And interestingly, SRAM has actually improved the way that they manufacture the brakes. So as well as making them slightly better and having more consistency in that, they've actually reduced the cost so they can offer you more for your hard earned cash. Now here's another small thing that really pleases me about these brakes. They've got slightly new hoses on them. Now have you ever noticed that sometimes brake hoses follow their own path, they get coiled up, they get kinks and they deform, especially if they've been off the bike and they've been in storage, for example, where they've been coiled up. Now this has always bugged me because it gives messy cables, messy cockpit. No one likes a messy cockpit, do they? And clearly it annoyed one of the designers at SRAM as well. So, They've gone back to the drawing board and they spec'd brand new brake hoses on them, which visually don't look much different. They're slightly more gloss on the previous guide brakes and these are a matte black on these new ones, but they feel slightly differently and they're far more resistant to kinks and deforming. Now the caliper itself is a brand new design. It's a completely new piece of kit from SRAM. Now it has the same hose connection as the previous one, so all the fittings will continue to work and it uses the same brake pad shape as well. SRAM have taken everything they learnt from making the code caliper, which is bigger, heavier and more powerful, and basically developed a smaller, lighter version of it. Now in order to increase the brake power of the G2 caliper, they needed some more bulk on it and they needed to basically decrease the size of the pad pocket, which again adds more material around the rest of the brake caliper. Now this effectively reduces caliper splay, basically the caliper wanting to sort of flex slightly under braking. You think how much force is going from a brake lever with lots of leverage, forcing fluid through a line and into those pistons. You know, what you want is for those pistons to just grab that disc rotor securely. If there's any sort of flex, you're losing power there. So that is what these are designed to minimize. Now, during the process of manufacturing the G2 caliper, they've actually refined the way that they actually build the calipers. As an upside, it means the piston and the seal interface is much better the way it's engineered. And it also means that, as a slight upside as well in performance terms, the bite point stays consistent throughout pad life, which means the lever will stay in the same place no matter how worn out your brake pads are. And I know for one, like it drives me mad having to twiddle the knobs on brake levers to sort of take up the compensation as pads wear. It shouldn't happen and it will not happen with the G2. So what are they actually like to use then? Well, they're brake levers, aren't they? So they sit on the bars, they don't do anything until you want them to. They sit there quietly, you adjust the reach, the bite point, all that sort of stuff. Um, look, this isn't a review, so I'm not gonna treat it like one, but there are a few more points that we still need to cover. They are indeed very powerful brakes, but how you set them up is entirely up to you and it does make a difference, whether that's down to the pad material or the rotor size. I've got 180s on here, you might feel like you need 200s or indeed 220 millimeters. It's entirely up to you how much power you wanna get out of these brakes. SRAM say power-wise, they're somewhere between the Guide S4 four-piston brake and the Code downhill brake or the free ride brake. Um, ultimately, they're very powerful brakes and 7% more powerful, in fact, than the previous generation of guide brakes. Cool. Now, having more braking power is certainly a great thing for a mountain bike to have any mountain biker. And ultimately means you're gonna be able to ride faster and have less fatigue. But it's not always that simple. Now, there are a number of different factors you have to take into account with putting a quality set of brakes onto a bike. Now, your tires
tires are just one of them. Are they good quality tires that have got a tread design that suits where you ride? Have you got them at a suitable pressure that enables the tire to deform and give enough traction when you're braking? Have you even got the correct size disc rotors for the way you ride, how heavy you are, and the type of terrain you're likely to be riding? Definitely something to take into account. Now, of course, suspension setup dramatically affects the braking of a bike. If your suspension isn't dialed in correctly with sufficient sag, for your body weight and your riding style, then you're likely to lose traction more than you are slow down, i.e. grab a handful of brake and your wheel's gonna slide out. That's not gonna have the desired effect. And now finally, the biggest thing is your body position and the way that you actively control the brakes. You get all of those things right and you put a set of these on your bike, you've got some immensely powerful and predictable brakes. Okay, so what are they like to set up and maintain? Well easy in a word. So first up they've got their tri-line system so for when you're actually setting up the calipers themselves means you can actually adjust the caliper angles as well as in and out up and down all that business so dead easy to center around the disc rotor for no rub. Added to that that there's slightly more distance between the pad and the rotor itself now so dead easy to set that up. And when it comes to the levers well this is even easier so if I just bring the levers in Firstly, they've got the matchmaker system, so it's dead easy to set your brakes up and have your shifter on the underneath there. And then, this is one of the coolest things. So if I just undo the clamp here, and you will see, on some other brake levers, you have a left and a right specific, which means if you run your front brake on the right, for example, moto, like we do here in the UK, it means you might have to swap the cables or the hoses over, and that's a bit of a problem. Whereas if you run the brakes, I don't know, let's say we call it um, the wrong way around, maybe something like that. Nice and easy just to flip them over. Ambidextrous levers, brilliant. That means no bleeding, no fuss if you want to swap the brakes over to suit riders from different continents. And finally, brake pads, which is the last thing. So there's now different options. Before they previously had like their organic pad and they had a metal pad. Now there's two organic pads and one metal pad. So the metal pad, they're very hard wearing, they're very powerful. They do need to sort of get up to temperature to work for maximum effect. So they don't suit all riders. Now with the organic pads, previously they just had the black pad. This still exists, only it's known as the quiet pad now. They've also got the power pad. Now the power pad is, it's got a hell of a lot more bite to it than the original quiet pad does. And it's also got a gray backing plate for visibility. It does make a little bit more noise than the quiet pad, but there you go, there's three options available for you. Can I use them on e-bikes? Yeah, of course you can use the G2 brakes on e-bikes. There's plenty of power there, but they do make the Guide RE, which is specifically designed for e-bikes. Although perhaps if you're more of a shuttle-based rider using your e-bike to get you to the top of the hills in order to shred those downhills, perhaps the Code might be a better option for you, seeing as it's gravity-focused riding, and you're gonna be making the most of having all-out power, loads of traction. And for some pricing and details, firstly, the G2 RSC. They retail for 180 US dollars, that's 190 in euros and 170 pounds in UK sterling. Now they weigh 255 grams, that's for an 850 mil hose, including the fluid in there. And for the G2 Ultimate, they retail for 280 US dollars or 290 euros, uh, 265 pounds sterling, and they weigh just 242 grams for a full 850 mil length with fluid. So there we go, that is our first look of the brand new SRAM G2 brakes. If you want to know anything else, if you've got any comments, let us know underneath this video. And in the meantime, if you want a couple more related videos for learning how to bleed brakes like this, I've got the bleeding edge feature, click down here. And if you want to learn about the SRAM access system, click down here. As always, if you love what we do here at GMBN Tech, give us a huge thumbs up and don't forget to share and subscribe.